Mucus Free Life LLC presents Professor Arnold Eretz's Mucusless Diet Healing System, annotated, revised, and edited by Professor Spira, written by Professor Arnold Eret, annotated, revised, and edited by Professor Spira, narrated by Justin Fraction. The content found in this audiobook is based upon the opinions and research of the authors and is strictly for informational and educational purposes only. If you choose to use the material in this audiobook on yourself, the authors and publishers take no responsibility for your actions and decisions or the consequences thereof. The content is not intended to replace a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a qualified healthcare professional or dietitian, and is not intended as medical advice. It is intended as a sharing of knowledge, information about health, and opinions, based on the research and experiences of the authors and their collaborators. Biographical Sketch of Professor Arnold Eret Professor Arnold Eret was a German healer, dietitian, philosopher, teacher, visionary, and one of the first people to advocate fasting and a plant-based, vegan, and mucus-free lifestyle as a therapy for healing. For over 100 years, his written works and teachings have touched the lives of thousands of health seekers, pursuing higher levels of vitality. Eret's most famous books, Mucusless Diet Healing System and Rational Fasting, continue to increase in popularity as plant-based, vegan, and raw food diets become more prevalent. Eret believed that pus and mucus-forming foods were unnatural for humans to eat, and suggested that a diet of fruits and green leafy vegetables i.e., mucus-free foods, are the most healing and powerful foods for humans. Eret offers a sophisticated yet simple and safe transitional system for those who endeavor to stop eating pus and mucus-forming foods. Early Life Arnold Eret was born July 29, 1866, near Freiburg in Baden, Germany. His father was a gifted farmer who was so technologically advanced that he crafted all of his own farming equipment. Like his father, Eret would be endowed with a passion for studying the cause and effect of phenomena. His courses of interest were physics, chemistry, drawing, and painting. He also had an affinity for linguistics and could speak German, French, Italian, and English. At the age of 21, he graduated as a professor of drawing and was drafted into the military, only to be discharged because of heart trouble. At the age of 31, he was diagnosed with Bright's disease, inflammation of the kidneys, and pronounced incurable by 24 of Europe's most respected doctors. He then explored natural healing and visited sanitariums to learn holistic methods and philosophies. In a desperate attempt to quench his misery, Eret decided to stop eating. To his amazement, he did not die, but gained strength and vitality. In 1899, he traveled to Berlin to study vegetarianism, followed by a trip to Algiers in northern Africa, where he experimented with fasting and fruit dieting. Due to his new lifestyle, Eric completely cured himself of all of his diseases and then could perform great feats of physiological strength, including an 800-mile bicycle trip from Algiers to Tunis. His discovery caused him to posit that pus and mucus-forming foods are the fundamental cause for all human illness and that fasting, simply eating less, is nature's primary method of cleansing the body of the effects of unnatural eating successful healer. In the early 1900s, Eret opened a hugely popular sanitarium in Ascana, Switzerland, where he treated and cured thousands of patients considered incurable by the so-called medical authorities. During the latter part of the decade, Eret engaged in a series of fasts monitored by German and Swiss officials. Within a period of 14 months, Eret completed one fast of 21 days, one of 24 days, one of 32 days, and one of 49 days, which stood as a world record for many years. Ultimately, Eret became one of the most in-demand health lecturers, journalists, and educators in Europe, saving the lives of thousands of people. On June 27, 1914, just before World War I, Eret left from Bremen for the United States to see the Panama Exposition and sample the fruits of the continent. He found his way to California, which was of special interest to him. This was because the region was undergoing a horticultural renaissance due to botanists like Luther Burbank, who later paid tribute to Eret. 
At the time, the University of California, Riverside, also owned the world's largest collection of rare fruits. When the war prevented Erich from returning to Germany, he settled in Mount Washington, Los Angeles, where he prepared his manuscripts and diplomas in his cultivated eating gardens. He and other back to naturists began to influence local populations of young people to investigate plant-based natural living. Benedict Lust, a student of Eretz and early proponent of naturopathy, initially distributed the English-language books of Eretz, Kneipp, Kuhn, Just, and Engelhardt in the United States. This included Eretz, Kranke Munchen, literally sick human beings, which became a best-seller. Eret worked at Lust, Youngborn Sanitarium, for five years. Then Eret opened his own sanitarium in Alhambra, California, before a lecture tour. His course on the mucusless diet healing system became a book of 25 lessons for his students. The book, along with rational fasting, became his most important and popular publications. Eret also developed and marketed his popular inner clean herbal laxative formula. Death on October 9, 1922, just two weeks after he completed the mucusless diet healing system, he finished a series of four lectures on regaining health through fasting and the grape cure, grape and grape juice fasting. At the assembly room of the Angeles Hotel on 4th and Spring Streets, where it was reported that over a hundred persons were unable to find seats. After leaving the building between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., Eret, aged 56, fell and sustained a fatal blow to his skull. According to Eret's business partner and publisher, Fred S. Hirsch, DNS, he was walking briskly on a wet, oil-soaked street during foggy conditions when he slipped on the curb and fell backwards onto his head. Hirsch did not actually witness the fall, but found Eret lying on the street. Carl Kuhn, Eret's German publisher during the 1920s, even questioned whether Eret's fall was really an accident. Benedict Lust maintained that Eret was wearing his first pair of new dress shoes and slipped as a result of his unfamiliarity with the footwear. To this day, the true nature of Eret's death raises suspicion among his followers. Eret's powerful healing successes, along with his influential and revolutionary new lifestyle, threatened the medical, meat, and dairy industries. Due to these factors, many believe that foul play was involved in Eret's untimely death. His writings on religion and family were also considered quite controversial. In the decades following Eret's death, Fred Hirsch had many legal battles with medical authorities over the word mucus and the inner clean laxative, legacy. Arnold Eret is a cultural icon and was an important protagonist of the emerging back-to-nature renaissance in Germany and Switzerland during the latter part of the 19th century. The influence of this renaissance spread to America and influenced many countercultural movements, including the Beat Generation, the vegetarian driven hippie movement, veganism, and fruitarianism. Throughout the 20th century, Eret's teachings have thrived and developed through the sincere efforts of a small group of dedicated Eretists. Today, Eret's teachings are gaining wider acceptance throughout the world as more people seek to investigate plant based vegan healing and detoxification. Professor Spira, June 2013. Introduction to the Annotated Version Greetings, Brothers and Sisters When I began practicing the mucusless diet healing system 13 years ago, I had the privilege of having access to a community of practitioners that had built on Arnold Eret's profound work and developed it into a sustainable lifestyle and dietetic art form. I spent hours talking with them about the details of the book and had all of my newbie questions thoroughly answered. Brother Eyre, the 35-year practitioner of the mucusless diet who introduced me to it, took me to supermarkets and showed me how to shop for the diet. He also would invite me into his home to show me how to properly prepare food. My intensive analysis of the mucusless diet healing system book, unprecedented access to some of the most advanced practitioners in the world, and more than a decade of experience, have helped me to gain the insights necessary to create the following annotated version. I take little credit for my additions and must humbly thank Brother Eyre, Victor B., Kalik, and the many others who took the time to help me learn as much about the mucusless diet as possible. I would also like to thank Fred Hirsch, Eret's most trusted student and most important proliferator of his works, and Alvin Last, who purchased Eret Publishing from Fred Hirsch in the early 1970s 
and kept the books in print into the 21st century. And, of course, I would also like to thank Arnold Errett, whose genius has changed the lives of multitudes of people. The inspiration for this newly edited, updated, and annotated version of Arnold Errett's Mucusless Diet Healing System emerged about two years after I had read the book. I could not stop reading the book over and over again, and found it to be a true work of genius. Yet, as I began to examine it more deeply, I noticed certain issues that might prevent first-time or contemporary readers from gaining full comprehension. Occasional archaic and hard-to-understand syntax, content contradictions, and the author's collegial attempts to have dietetic dialogues with his peers, all of whom he was miles ahead of, caused many readers to misunderstand some aspects of his message. Over the years, I have received many of the same questions from mucusless diet readers. The purpose of this book is to address some of the most common questions and make editorial updates for a 21st century audience. My goal is not to rewrite the mucusless diet, but to create a reference document that will facilitate comprehension and understanding for modern audiences. My notes and additions will appear in mainly two ways, including endnotes at the conclusion of lessons and editorial statements inserted directly into the text. Exceptions include the reworking of Ragnar Berg's Table for Clarity and updates to some of the vegetarian recipes added by the editor, Fred Hirsch. Thorough explanations precede all such alterations. What is the best way to use this book? If you have never read the mucusless diet healing system before, I suggest the following method. Read each chapter in its entirety, skipping over all of the notes. Then immediately reread the chapter with your primary focus being on the annotations. If you are already familiar with Eret's original work, then the best method for you may be to read the annotations as you go along from the beginning. This document can also be used as a reference book to quickly look up common questions related to the diet. The principles of the mucusless diet healing system are timeless and desperately needed today. In a world where there is much confusion about the nature of human illness, Eret provides a simple yet incredibly advanced system to achieve wellness and superior health. Peace, Love, and Breath, Professor Spira, September 2015「We read in the Bible, Genesis 1.29, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the earth, and every tree in which the fruit yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. You will note that the word meat is used to denote a human's food, not the carcass of dead animals. Arnold Errett was a student and follower of nature's laws, in communion with God. Errett's teachings have their foundation in truth. But until they are demonstrated, the average individual cannot grasp their significance and consequently, not until then, do they prove acceptable to the great majority. Arnold Errett described and denounced superstition and ignorance, but like similar teachings of great men, his teachings have been grossly misunderstood by the average individual and unjustly criticized by many health teachers. It has now been well over seventy years that his voice was first heard vainly sounding a note of warning desperately hoping to dispel the colossal ignorance of the average uninformed individual concerning natural laws. His teachings have opened many new avenues of healing, and his wonderful philosophy and knowledge offer to those willing to accept bring thousands of new converts each year from every part of the globe. Eric taught that the mind governs all organic action of the physical body, instinctively, and we therefore find humankind gradually evolving from the primitive stage to a higher intellectual plane. The physical and mental welfare of millions of individuals living today are desperately searching for a truthful presentation of this knowledge found only in Professor Arnold Errett's message, and it is therefore eagerly awaited by an expectant world. Is it asking too much that you lay aside preconceived ideas, opinions, or prejudices, and read the Errett articles with an open mind? Hopefully, the truth will eventually dawn upon you, possibly months after reading, for some portion may have indelibly stamped an imprint on your mind and intuitively proven its correctness. There is no mystery connected with Eret's mucusless diet theory, though it differs almost entirely from other healing systems, especially his lucid explanations. Eret practiced no deception. His statements are easily understood because of their outstanding simplicity of expression. He continually informs the student, whatsoever is not simple, easily understood, is false, and therefore not the truth. Fundamentally, Eret's teachings of his philosophy are basically the love of nature itself.
love of all outdoors, the love of flowers and trees, the love of all of the birds and animals. Eric loved the sunshine and the rain, the cold and the warmth, the bright days and the cloudy days, and he sincerely taught that we must feel justly proud of our own physical bodies, clean both internally and externally. Our love of birds and four-legged animals instinctively warns that we must not harm these fellow creatures and never kill them for our food. Mother Nature has abundantly supplied us with quantities of delicious, nutritious fruits and vegetables on which we thrive. With a clean bloodstream coursing through our bodies, any thought of cannibalism becomes obnoxious. Arnold Errett taught tolerance, respect for the rights of others, and acceptance of their rights to their own beliefs. Never attempt to force others to accept your beliefs, but rather through precept and example create a desire on the part of those interested in health to seek this great truth of their own free will. Through your tolerance of ignorance, you will have proven your superiority, and eventually non-believers will see the bright glow of truth. Fred S. Hirsch, DNS, Errant Literature General Introductory Principles Lesson 1 Every disease, no matter what name it is known by medical science, is constipation. It is a clogging up of the entire pipe system of the human body. Any special symptom is therefore merely an extraordinary local constipation by more accumulated mucus at this particular place. Special accumulation points are the tongue, the stomach, and particularly the entire digestive tract. This last is the real and deeper cause of bowel constipation. The average person has as much as 10 pounds of uneliminated feces in the bowels, continually poisoning the bloodstream in the entire system. Think of it. Every sick person has a more or less mucus-clogged system, such mucus being derived from undigested, uneliminated, and unnatural food substances accumulated from childhood on. Details regarding this fact may be learned by reading my Rational Fasting and Regeneration Diet. My mucus theory and mucusless diet healing system stand unshaken. It has proven the most successful compensation action, so-called cure against every kind of disease. By its systematic application, thousands of declared incurable patients could be saved. The mucusless diet consists of all kinds of raw and cooked fruits, starchless vegetables, and cooked or raw, mostly green leaf vegetables. The mucusless diet healing system is a combination of individually advised, long or short fasts, with progressively changing menus of non-mucus forming foods. This diet alone can heal every case of disease without fasting, although such a cure requires longer time. The system itself will be expounded in later lessons. However, to learn how to apply this system and understand how and why it works, it is necessary to free your mind of medical errors partly taken by naturopathy. In other words, I must teach you a new physiology, free from medical errors, a new method of diagnosis, a correction of the fundamental errors of metabolism, high-protein foods, blood circulation, blood composition, and last but not least, you must be taught what vitality really is. To medical science, the human body is still a mystery, especially in a diseased condition. Every new disease discovered by doctors is a new mystery for them. There are no words to express how far they are from the truth. Naturopathy uses the word vitality continually. Yet, neither medical scientist nor naturopaths can tell what vitality is. Not only is it necessary to eradicate all these errors from your brain, but to show you the truth in such a new and simple light that you can grasp it at once. This great advantage of simplicity and clarity is one of the fundamental reasons for my success. With all, my teachings cover the truth. Incidentally, whatever simple reason cannot grasp is humbug, however scientific it may sound. You will learn how wrong and ignorant it is to believe that any special disease can be healed by eating the right food, living on special menus, or undergoing long fasts. If such is done without experience and without system, and special advice for each individual case, Fasting has been known for hundreds of years as compensation against every disease. As nature's only and infallible law, and the same with the mucusless diet, as already stated in Genesis, fruits and herbs, i.e., green leaves. But why did it never come into general use and result in universal success? 
This is because it was never used systematically in accordance with the condition of the patient. The average man or woman has not the slightest idea what the necessary eliminative process is, what time it requires, how and how often their diet must be changed, or what it means to cleanse the body of the terrible quantities of waste that they have accumulated in their bodies during their lives. Disease is an effort of the body to eliminate waste, mucus, and toxemias, and this system assists nature in the most perfect and natural way. Not the disease, but the body is to be healed. It must be cleansed, freed from waste and foreign matter, from mucus and toxemias, accumulated since childhood. You cannot buy health in a bottle. You cannot heal your body, that is, cleanse your system in a few days. You must make compensation for the wrong you have done your body all your life. My system is not a cure or remedy. It is a regeneration, a thorough house cleaning, an acquisition of such clean and perfect health as you never knew before. Remember, your constitutional encumbrances throughout the entire system are the source of every disease. The greatest and most harmful source of lowered vitality, imperfect health, lack of strength and endurance, and any and all imperfect conditions. All disease has its source in the colon, never perfectly emptied since your birth. Nobody on earth today has an ideally clean body, and therefore perfectly clean blood. What medical science calls normal health is in fact a pathological condition. In summa, the human mechanism is an elastic pipe system. The diet of civilization is never entirely digested, nor the resultant waste eliminated. This entire pipe system is slowly constipated, especially at the place of the symptom and the digestive tract. This is the foundation of every disease, to loosen this waste, eliminate it intelligently and carefully, and to control this operation, can only be done perfectly by the mucusless diet healing system. Lesson 1 Footnotes Number 1 Many people assume that Eret is referring only to bowel constipation. However, his use of the word is much broader in scope, referring to constitutional encumbrances on the cellular level that have been obstructing one's organism since birth. Although Eret does assert that the foundation of cellular constipation is bowel constipation, which is the definite result of eating pus and mucus-forming foods, Eret's concept of the term extends beyond the bowels. Number 2. The word mucus is from the Latin mucus, which means slime, mold, snot, etc. Mucus refers to a thick, viscous, slippery discharge that is comprised of dead cells, mucin, inorganic salts, water, and exfoliated cells. It also refers to the slimy, sticky, viscous substance left behind by mucus-forming foods in the body after ingestion. Number 3. This fact may be hard to believe at first. Later in this book, Eret will discuss cases where he helped people eliminate a lot more than 10 pounds of fecal matter from the bowels. Also, since the time of Eret, other naturopaths have observed and documented the elimination of pounds of mucoid plaque, rubber-like strings of rotting mucus found in the intestines, feces, decades-old feces stones, and other toxemias. To look at some compelling pictorial examples of such waste, see Bernard Jensen's Tissue Cleansing Through Bowel Management. Keep in mind that most of the dietary prescriptions in the book are problematic, and I do not recommend using them. However, the real pictures of the kind of internal waste that humans harbor are profound. Number 4. Mucusless refers to foods that are not mucus-forming. Such foods digest without leaving behind a thick, viscous, slimy substance called mucus. These foods include all kinds of fat-free and starchless fruits and vegetables. Number 5. The word fruit refers to the ripened ovary or ovaries of a seed-bearing plant, together with accessory parts containing the seeds and occurring in a wide variety of forms. Eric is specifically referring to mucusless fruits, fat-free and starchless fruits, that leave behind no mucus residue. An unripe banana is an example of a starchy fruit, while an avocado is a fatty one. Green leafy vegetables refers to various mucusless leafy plants or their leaves and stems that may be eaten as vegetables. Number 6. The word fast means to abstain from the intake of food and drink for a period of time. It may also refer to various forms of dietary restriction, which include abstaining from solid foods, juice or liquid fasting, mucus-forming foods, mucusless diet, animal products, and so forth. Fasting may also refer more broadly to abstaining from modern conveniences or unnatural additions. For example, a fast from electricity or the use of electronics for a period of time. Mucus forming refers to foods that create or leave behind uneliminated mucus in the human body. Such foods include meats, dairy, grains, starches, and fats.
Ert periodically uses the term disease to refer to human illness, yet Ert suggests that the word is inherently problematic, hence appearing in quotations. With that said, Ert does not ever purport to treat diseases, but to naturally heal human illness through a change in diet toward mucusless foods and short-term fasting. Since the initial publication of the mucusless diet, the use of the word disease by non-medical professionals has been vigorously contested. In many countries, people face legal consequences for diagnosing or claiming to cure what the medical profession refers to as disease. To gain insight into the meaning of the word disease, we must consider its etymology, historical origins. The term disease can be traced back to the early 14th century, when it meant discomfort or inconvenience. It derives from the old French disease, meaning lack, want, discomfort, distress, trouble, misfortune, or sickness. Literally, des dis, meaning without a way, and aise, or ease, meaning comfort, pleasure, or well-being. The word was still commonly used in its literal sense until the early part of the 17th century, and has been revived in modern usage with the spelling disease. By the 17th century, the word disease was also being used to identify specific conditions of the body, or of some body part or organ, in which its functions are disturbed or deranged. Over time, the word came to be used to identify a species of disorder or ailment, in which they exhibit special symptoms or affect a specific organ. Customarily, the defining words of the disease either indicate its symptomatic nature, were derived from the surname of a person who has suffered from it, or the surname of the physician who first diagnosed it. For example, Bright's disease, the disease Eret was diagnosed with, and which he cured himself of, was first described in 1827 by the English physician Richard Bright. Eret tends to use the term disease in its original sense, which is to refer to a distressing or uncomfortable condition of the body. Yet, he identifies the express purpose of this condition to be an effort of the body to eliminate waste, mucus, and toxemias. This is a significant definition of disease because it is one of the foundational concepts for the mucusless diet that we eat for the purpose of cleansing and not to obtain nutritional sustenance. Yet, in subsequent lessons, Eret does critique the medical notion of diseases and shows how a mucusless diet expert can use and interpret medical diagnoses to determine what type of transition diet and fasting protocols to suggest to their patients. Number 7. The term naturopathy was coined in 1895 by John Scheel and made famous in the United States by one of Eret's students named Benedict Lust, who founded the first school of naturopathy in 1902. Naturopathic medicine favors a holistic and drugless approach to healing and seeks to find the least invasive measures necessary to relieve symptoms and heal human illness. Natural hygiene, or orthopathy, is a healing philosophy derived from naturopathy that advocates plant-based diets and periods of intermittent fasting. Although many prominent naturopaths and natural hygienic practitioners were, and continue to be, greatly influenced by Eretz's works, their healing practices and philosophies about nutrition usually greatly differ from Eretz. Number 8. Science comes from the Latin sentia, meaning knowledge. The term refers to a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge, in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Also, it may be identified to be the methodical study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experimentation. Medical science refers to an institution specializing in the treatment of diseases. Number 9. The term system in this sense refers to a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, and slash or, an organized scheme or method. It is important to remember that the mucusless diet is a systematic approach to eating. It is important to not become overzealous and rush through, or skip over aspects of the systematic transition, discussed throughout the book. Number 10. In Genesis 1, section 29, the voice of God tells Adam and Eve that their diet should consist of fruit. Although there are many different translations of the verse, they all have a similar meaning. That suggests the first humans were at best fruitarians, or at worst, raw and mucusless fruit and vegetable eaters. One common variation is from the Vulgate, which is a late 4th century Latin translation of the Bible. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb, plant, bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food, meat. Vulgate translation. According to this verse, the fruit of a tree yielding seed, as well as the seeded fruits from herbs, plants such as grapevine, are to be the food of humans. Such foods perfectly situate humans into the circle of plant and animal life on this planet. In theory, when humans living in nature eat fruit, they either consume its seeds or discard them onto the fertile ground. Seeds that were eaten would eventually return to the earth following a bowel movement. 
The seeds then have the potential to germinate and produce a new tree or plant which will grow more fruit. Humans cannot eat processed foods or dead animal flesh and hope to directly produce more packaged foods or living animals. Genesis 1, section 29, is the second utterance from God to humans. The first is in Genesis 1, section 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Vulgate Translation It must be pointed out that humans were to have dominion over animals, but not to eat them. In fact, animals did not even have the right to eat other animals in Eden. Genesis 1, section 30 states, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, food, and it was so. Vulgate Translation This would suggest that the first animals were inherently herbivores when not fully fruitarian. I point this out because many readers have interpreted herbs in Genesis 1, section 29 to signify that humans are inherently vegetable eaters. My interpretation is that humans are to have the fruit from the herbs, plants. Thus, a grapevine is an herb that produces seed-bearing fruit. We need not eat the vine or its leaves, but the grapes that are produced from it. With that said, Genesis 1, section 29 and 1, section 30 together offer the proposition of a mucus-free world inhabited by mucusless humans and animals. In sum, volumes can and have been written about these several verses and principles of life on earth. Many spiritual and religious philosophies have suggested that superior humans are fruit-eaters and frequent fasters. Christianity, Judaism, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Islam, ancient Egyptian mystery schools, and more, all have strong fasting traditions, and many propagate various forms or degrees of fruit dieting. Eret, a student of world culture and religion, took note of this fact and would periodically invoke Genesis 1, section 29, and discuss various fasting traditions in his teachings. Latent, Acute, and Chronic Diseases, No Longer a Mystery, Lesson 2 The first lesson has now given you an insight as to what disease actually is. In addition to mucus and its toxemias in the system, there are other foreign matters such as uric acid, toxins, etc., and especially drugs if ever used. I learned through years of practical experience that drugs are never eliminated, as is the waste from foods, but are stored up in the body for decades. Hundreds of cases have come under my observation, where drugs taken 10, 20, 30, and even 40 years ago were expelled together with mucus through this perfect healing system. This is a fact of basic importance, especially for the practitioner. When these chemical poisons, after being dissolved, are taken back into circulation for elimination through the kidneys, the nerves and heart are affected, causing extreme nervousness, dizziness, and excessive heartbeats as well as other strange sensations. The uninformed stands before a mystery and probably calls the family doctor, who now diagnoses the condition as heart disease and blames the lack of food instead of the drugs he prescribed ten years ago. The average normal man or woman, considered healthy, has a chronic stored-up accumulation of waste food, poisons, and drugs. This is his or her latent disease. When these latent disease matters are occasionally stirred up, for instance, by a cold, a person expels great quantities of mucus and feels unhappy. Instead of enjoying nature's cleansing process, if the quantity of loosened mucus is great enough to more or less shock the entire system, but still not dangerous, it may be diagnosed as influenza. If the eliminating work of nature digs deeper into the system, especially into that important organ, the lungs, so much mucus and poisons are loosened at once that the circulation has to work under great friction, similar to a dirty machine, or, for example, an automobile running with its brakes set. The friction produces abnormal heat, which is called fever. The doctors call it pneumonia, which is really a feverish effort on nature's part to free the most vital organs from its waste. If the kidneys are called upon to eliminate this loosened mucus, thereby shocking this organ, it is called nephritis. In other words, whenever nature endeavors to save a human life through her efforts to feverishly eliminate mucus and its toxic products, it is called acute disease. The medical profession has over 4,000 names for different ailments. The particular or special name of the disease is made up according to the respective local place of elimination, or to the congested point where the bloodstream finds a difficult passage and causes pain, such as pains in the joints, as in cases of rheumatism. 
For ages, this well-meaning effort and intended self-healing work of nature has been misunderstood and suppressed through the agency of drugs and the continuance of eating, despite the warning danger signals of pain and loss of appetite. Notwithstanding, the help of doctors, a help, in fact, injurious and dangerous to the patient's life, their vitality and especially their eliminating abilities are lowered, and nature proceeds slowly. Under this handicap, nature cannot work as efficiently, requiring more time, and the case is called chronic. The word chronic is derived from the Greek word chronos, meaning time. You will be taught more about this mystery in Lessons 3 and 4. Lesson 2. Footnotes. Number 1. The word elimination refers to the removal of physiological waste and encumbrances from the bloodstream, lymph system, or body. The term is also used by many practitioners of the mucusless diet healing system to identify short or extended periods of intensive waste elimination. These practitioners use the term instead of the word sick, as the connotation of the latter is believed to be problematic. In parlance, a practitioner may say, I'm going through an intense elimination today, meaning that he or she is presumably eliminating large quantities of waste and experiencing various symptoms of human illness. Instances of elimination usually spur a practitioner to detoxify, fast, or abstain from mucus-forming foods. As waste is loosened, the body will try to eliminate it by any means necessary. Elimination may occur through the bowels, kidneys, skin, sinuses, eyes, ears, hair, mouth, and so forth. Number 2. In 2007, the World Health Organization distinguished over 12,420 disease categories. This number increases every year. Why the Diagnosis? Lesson 3. Why the Diagnosis? Laymen, and even some dietetic experts, with the exception of myself, believe there is no need for diagnosis. You may ask, since there is only one disease, why the diagnosis? If all sickness is due to uncleanliness caused by uneliminated, undigested food, mucus, uric acid, toxemias, drugs, and so forth, why diagnose? We shall now learn why fruit diet and fasting have produced such doubtful results through their incorrect use and misunderstanding, caused by the belief that general rules of this cure are suitable for everybody and for every case. Nothing is further from the truth. No other cure requires so much individual specialization and continual changing to meet the reaction of the patient. This is why people who attempt these methods of cure without expert advice frequently bring about serious results. Promiscuous Fasting McFadden, and many others, for instance, advised fasting as applicable to all cases. I learned through thousands of cases during my experience that nothing requires more individual, different application than fasting and the mucusless diet. Of two patients, one may recover completely after a fast of two or three weeks, while the other may die from the same treatment. That is why an individual diagnosis of general conditions and constitutional encumbrances is so necessary. Method of Constitutional Diagnosis My diagnosis determines the following points. 1. The relative amount of encumbrance in the system. 2. The predominant part, that is, whether more mucus or more poisons. 3. If pus is present in the system, and the amount and kind of drugs used. 4. If internal tissue or an organ is in process of decomposition, and 5. How far vitality is lowered. You will also learn through experience and observations along these lines that the general appearance, especially the face of the patient, will indicate more or less the internal condition. Medical Diagnosis Medical diagnosis throws no real light on the subject, although doctors think it more important than the actual cure. It is made up of a series of reports of symptoms and a scheme of experiences from which thousands of diseases are named. Characteristic of the meaningless medical diagnosis is the frequent statement of many patients that the doctor could not find out what I have. The name of the disease does not concern us at all. A person with gout, one with indigestion, or one with Bright's disease may start with the same advice. Whether to fast, for instance, and how long does not depend upon the name of the disease but upon the patient's condition and how far vitality is lowered. Naturopathic Concepts Naturopathy is an advance over medicine in teaching that all disease is constitutional. Yet, naturopathy does not explain sufficiently the source, nature, and composition of foreign matters as the fundamental oneness of all disease. Dr. Lehman said, Every disease is caused by carbonic acid and gas, 
but he did not learn its source in decayed, uneliminated food substance, the mucus in a state of continuous fermentation. Dr. Yeager said, Disease is a stench. Nature gives diagnosis through bad odor, which indicates how far the inside decomposition has progressed. Dr. Haig of England, the founder of the anti-uric acid diet, based his conception of general diagnosis on the assumption that the majority of diseases are caused through uric acid, certainly an important part of diseased matter besides mucus. Naturopathy puts considerable stress and importance on symptomatic diagnosis in spite of the acknowledgement that there is only one disease, uric diagnosis. Medical doctors and many others consider this special kind of diagnosis as the most important one, but it is fundamentally misunderstood. Besides the digestive tract, the uric canal is the main avenue of elimination. As soon as anyone decreases their eating, fasts a little, or changes over to the natural diet, he or she has waste, mucus, poisons, uric acid, phosphates, and so on, in their urine. And an analysis of this urine is alarming. The same thing happens in the majority of cases whenever anyone becomes sick. Everyone becomes alarmed at this effort of the body to eliminate waste, which is, in truth, the healing, cleansing process. Should sugar or albumin be found in the urine, the case is called very serious and diagnosed as diabetes or Bright's disease, respectively. Under medical treatment, the patient in the first-named case dies through sugar starvation, caused through lack of sugar and sugar formers in the diet. In the latter diagnosis, the patient dies from forced albumin replacement, resulting from overfeeding of foods rich in albumin. Whatever the body expels is waste, decayed, dead and simply indicates that the patient is in an advanced state of inside uncleanliness, already causing a decomposition of inside organs, producing rapid decay of all food taken into the body. These cases, like tuberculosis, must be treated very carefully and very slowly. How it looks in the human colon It is of utmost importance that through our diagnosis, we must learn as much as possible the general appearance of the inside of the human body. Our diagnosis, therefore, consists in finding out the degree of quantities of individual waste matter of the patient. Experts in autopsy state they have found that from 60% to 70% of the colons examined have foreign matters such as worms and decades-old feces stones. The inside walls of the over-intestines are encrusted by old, hardened feces and resemble in appearance the inside of a filthy stovepipe. I had obese patients that eliminated from their body as much as 50 to 60 pounds of waste and 10 to 15 pounds alone from the colon, mainly consisting of foreign matters, especially old, hardened feces. The average so-called healthy person of today carries continually with them, since childhood, several pounds of never-eliminated feces. One, good stool a day means nothing. A fat and sick person is in fact a living cesspool. A distinct surprise to me was that a number of my patients in such condition had already undertaken so-called nature cures. Lesson 3. Footnotes Number 1. Neither Eret nor the editor of this book purports to diagnose medical diseases. Eret uses the word diagnosis to simply mean the interpretation of health issues based upon observable physiological factors. Eret's approach may be identified as the mucusless diet healing system diagnosis, as it is different from medical and even many naturopathic diagnostic approaches. As mentioned in Lesson 2, the medical name of a disease is not particularly important although such information may be used to determine the best way to apply the mucusless diet healing system. Number 2. Bernard McFadden, 1868-1955, through 1955, was an influential American proponent of physical culture and health. He also founded the long-running magazine publishing company McFadden Publications. One of his most famous magazines, Physical Culture, was first published in 1899. He was the predecessor of Charles Atlas and Jack LaLanne and has been credited with helping to begin the culture of health and fitness in the United States. McFadden was a strong proponent of fasting, and felt that it was the best way to achieve physical health. Many of his subjects would fast for a week with the goal of rejuvenating their body. He claimed that a person could exercise unqualified control over virtually all types of disease while revealing a degree of strength and stamina such as would put others to shame through fasting. Number 3. The word pus is from the late 14th century Latin pus related to pewter, putrid, rotten, from Proto-Indo-European pu, compared to Sanskrit puyati, rots, stink, puti, stinking, foul. Pus often refers to a thick, white, yellowish, or greenish opaque liquid 
produced an infected tissue consisting of dead white blood cells, bacteria, tissue debris, and serum. It also refers to the substance that dead animal flesh is chemically changed to after being consumed or while rotting. Thus, the ingestion of meat and dairy products create pus residue in the body. Number 4. Johann Heinrich Lehmann, 1860-1905, was a German physician and pioneer of naturopathic medicine. He earned his medical doctorate at the University of Heidelberg and became a general practitioner in Stuttgart. On 1st January 1888, he opened a sanatorium called the Psychiatric Sanatorium at Weiserhirsch outside of Dresden, which became internationally known. He eventually abandoned traditional treatment as he became disdainful of drugs and unnatural medications. He became a proponent of a vegetarian diet, exercise, and fresh air, and was an ardent practitioner of physiotherapy and hydrotherapy. Number 5. Gustav Jäger, 1832-1917, was a German naturalist, hygienist, and professor of zoology. In 1884, he abandoned teaching and started practice as a physician in Stuttgart. He advanced the first version of the pheromone concept, and wrote various works on biological subjects. He also advocated wearing rough animal-based fabrics such as wool in close proximity to the skin, and objected to the use of plant fibers like cotton. His teachings inspired the creation of the Jaeger clothing brand, 1884. Number 6. Alexander Haig, M.D., 1853-1924, through 1924, was the author of several books on diet and human illness. He is known for his theory that uric acid and foods that promote uric acid in the body are the foundation of human illness. For further reading, see Uric Acid, an Epitome of the Subject, 1906, and Uric Acid as a Factor in the Causation of Disease, a Contribution to the Pathology of High Blood Pressure, Headache, Epilepsy, Nervousness, Mental Disease, Asthma, Hay Fever, Paradoxical Hemoglobinuria, Anemia, Bright's Disease, Diabetes, Gout, Rheumatism, Bronchitis, and Other Disorders, 1908. Number 7. Eret is referring to the handful of illnesses in which medical doctors order people to avoid eating fruit and tell them to eat albuminous or pus-forming foods. From Eret's perspective, this is very problematic, as he finds mucusless fruits to be the key to cleaning the body and healing it. In such cases where fruit produces uncomfortable and dangerous symptoms, Eret suggests that the patient control their eliminations by eating a more vegetable-heavy transition diet, integrated with short periods of fasting. This will be covered in subsequent lessons. It must also be noted that simple sugars, carbohydrates, particularly fructose, which Eret often refers to as grape or fruit sugar, is instrumental to healing. Simple sugars, monosaccharides, would never be confused with complex sugars or complex carbohydrates that come from starch, milk, etc., which are injurious to the body and should be avoided. Number 8. The word albumin, A-L-B-U-M-E-N, also spelled A-L-B-U-M-I-N, was originally used to refer to the white of an egg deriving from Latin albumen, literally whiteness, from albus, white. It is a class of simple, water-soluble proteins that can be coagulated by heat and are found in egg whites, blood serum, milk, and many other animal and plant tissues. Albuminous refers to something consisting of, resembling, or containing albumen. Albuminous foods decompose into pus inside the body. The Diagnosis, Part 2, Lesson 4 Fat and Lean Types The bodily mechanism of the fat type is, on the average, mechanically more obstructed because he or she is, in general, an overeater of starchy foods. In the lean type, there is more physiological chemical interference with the organism, such as one being in general a one-sided meat eater, a condition which produces especially much acidity, uric acid, other poisons, and pus. Disease Story as a general rule, I ask my prospective patients the following questions, as the knowledge to be gained is of great importance. Number one, how long have you been sick? Number two, what did the doctor call your disease? Number three, what was the nature of the treatment? Number four, how much and what kinds of treatment was taken? Number five, have you ever been operated on? Number six, what other kinds of treatment have you taken before? Age, sex, whether a disease is inherited, etc., are important points. The most important thing, however, is the patient's diet at present, their special craving for certain foods, their wrong habits, and if constipated, and how long. What kinds of diets, if any, were used before?
It is necessary to base the change in diet on the patient's present diet, and only a slight change towards an improved diet is advisable. The experimental diagnosis. The most exact, unerring diagnosis we have is a short fast. The more rapidly the patient feels worse through a short fast, the greater and more poisonous is his or her encumbrance. Should they become dizzy, suffer severe headaches, etc., they are greatly clogged up with mucus and toxemias. If palpitation of the heart occurs, it is a sign that pus is somewhere in the system, or that drugs, even though taken many years ago, are in the circulation for elimination. Any inside special constipated place is located by light pain there. The experimental practitioner can ascertain better than with x-rays through nature's revelation after a short fast, the true condition of the inside of the human body, and knows the real diagnosis more correctly than doctors can ascertain with all their expensive scientific equipment and instruments. If this short fast diagnosis is tried on the average person called normal and healthy, but in reality clogged up with mucus and latent disease, nature reveals the same in a moderate degree. If a weak point has begun to develop, unsuspected by them, nature will unerringly indicate where and how he or she will later become sick if the wrong method of living is continued, although it may be after some years. This, then, is the prognosis of disease, some special diagnosis, to show that all differently named diseases, even the most severe ones, have their basis and are caused by the same general and constitutional encumbrance of the body. I shall show you, in the light of truth, a few characteristic kinds of cases. Through these illustrative examples, I shall prove that there is not a single disease, not a disturbance or sensation, not an unhealthy appearance or symptom, which cannot be explained and seen at once in its real nature as local constipation, constitutional constipation, by mucus and its toxemias. Most of the quantities continually supplied from the chronic reserve stock of waste in the stomach, intestines, and especially in the colon. The basement of the human temple is the reservoir from which Every symptom of disease and weakness is supplied in all its manifestations. A cold. It is a beneficial effort to eliminate waste from the cavities of the head, the throat, and the bronchial tubes. Pneumonia. The cold goes deeper and will eliminate and clean the mucus from the most spongy and vital organ, the lung. A hemorrhage occurs to clean more radically. The entire system is aroused, causing higher temperature by friction of the waste in circulation. That proves alarming, and the doctor suppresses this by drugs and food, and thus actually blocks nature's process of healing, cleansing. If the patient does not die, the elimination becomes chronic and is called consumption. The consumptive patient continually eliminates his or her mucus, caused from erroneously increased mucus-forming foods through the lungs instead of through natural ways. This organ itself decays more and more, producing germs and it is then called tuberculosis. The vital organ, lung, the pump, works insufficiently on the circulation. The entire cell system decays more and more, and decomposes before the patient dies. Toothache. Its pain is a warning signal of nature. Stop eating. I must repair. There's waste and pus. You have eaten too much lime-poor food, meat. Rheumatism and gout. Mucus and uric acid particularly accumulate in the joints, since there is less dependable part of the tissues for the passage of the circulation. Heavily loaded with waste and uric acid in the one-sided meat-eater's body. Stomach Trouble The stomach is the central organ of disease matter supply. There is a limit to the ability of this organ to digest and to empty itself after the meal. Every type of food, even the best kinds, is mixed with acid mucus continually remaining in the average person's stomach. The wonder is how long the human being can stand such conditions. Goiter. It is a deposit, by nature, of tremendous waste to keep it from entering the circulation. A boil. It is in principle the same as a goiter, only the elimination is outside. Stammering. It is a special accumulation of mucus in the throat, interfering with the functioning of the vocal cords. I have cured several cases. Liver and kidney diseases. These organs are of a very spongy construction, and their function is that of a kind of physiological sieve. They are, therefore, easily constipated by sticky mucus. Sex diseases. 
These have for their origin nothing more than mucus elimination through these organs and are easily healed. The use of drugs alone produces the characteristic symptoms of syphilis. The more drugs that have been used, especially mercury, the more carefully the treatment must be conducted. Ear and Eye Diseases Even short or farsightedness is congestion in the eyes and trouble with hearing from congestion of those organs. I healed a few kinds of blindness and deafness by the same principles. Mental Diseases Besides a congested system, I found that anyone mentally diseased has congestion, especially of the brain. One man on the verge of insanity was cured by a four-week fast. There is nothing easier to heal by fasting than insanity. Such men and women, having lost their reason, their natural instinct tells them not to eat. I learned that if you heal through the mucusless diet healing system, all kinds of illnesses, most of the patients are relieved of greater or lesser mental conditions. After a fast comes a clearer mind. Unity of ideas comes to take the place of differences. Differences of ideas today are caused largely by diet. If something is wrong with anyone, look first to the stomach. The mentally diseased man or woman suffers physiologically from gas pressure on the brain. Lesson 4 Footnotes Number 1. Arnold Ehrt categorizes human physiology into two main categories, fat, also called mucus, and lean, also called uric acid types. People with uric acid physiologies are often said to have high metabolisms and can seemingly eat a lot and not gain any weight. The misconception is that this person is healthier than an overweight person. This is often not the case as their body only handles mucus and pus differently than someone with a fatty or mucus physiology. This condition often occurs in people who are one-sided meat eaters, a condition that produces uric acid, other poisons, and pus. Essentially, instead of depositing mucus as fat throughout the organism, such waste is converted to poisonous acid. Low-carb diets that emphasize eating meat, such as the Atkins diet, essentially transform one's body type from fat to lean. Thus, weight loss for people on such a diet is a negative proposition, because they lose weight at the expense of creating much internal toxicity. Then people who participate in competitive eating are usually lean, uric acid types. Contrarily, when someone with a fat, mucus type of physiology eats pus and mucus-forming foods, it will usually result in weight gain. Eating great amounts of such foods is the cause of obesity in people with this type of physiology. Number two, one of the most misunderstood and often ignored elements of the mucusless diet healing system is the recommendation to adhere to only a slight change towards an improved diet at first. Although this is discussed in detail throughout the book, many people who endeavor to practice the diet without expert assistance try to skip the transition and go directly into long, fast, and aggressive fruit diets. It cannot be emphasized enough how wrong such an approach is. Eric does not recommend any patient do long, fast, or extended fruit dieting in the beginning. What does a slight change in diet look like? What is too slight and what is too aggressive? These questions will be explored further in subsequent lessons. Number 3. Consumption is an archaic term for what is currently referred to as pulmonary tuberculosis. Eret's discussion may also be generally applied to all obstructive lung diseases, which are respiratory illness characterized by airway obstruction. Terms used to denote various forms of constipation of the lungs include asthma, bronchiectasis, bronchitis, and chronic obstruction pulmonary disease, COPD. Number 4. By lime poor, Eret is referring to foods that lack minerals. Consider the concept of lime-rich soil which is highly alkaline and may be used to neutralize acidity. From Eret's perspective, the importance of mineral-rich foods is their cleansing properties. Number 5. For a detailed exploration of the fetid internal condition of the human stomach, see Eret's book, Thus Speaketh the Stomach. In this unique work, Eret gives voice to the stomach through a first-person perspective that allows the reader to intimately explore the foundation of human illness. Number 6. Today, stammering is more commonly referred to as stuttering, or disfluency. It is a type of communication and speech issue where a person speaks with sudden involuntary pauses and a tendency to repeat the initial letter of words. Number 7. Most people, no matter how healthy they seem, have weakened kidneys. As a result, they fail to filter as much cellular waste from their body as they should. As you progress with the mucusless diet, your urine may become very yellow or contain sediment. This happens as the kidneys begin to better filter the accumulated waste that you are now loosening. Number 8. Mercury is no longer used to treat venereal diseases. As early as the 1300s, it was used as a treatment for skin conditions. 
and there are reports of it being used to treat syphilis in 1496. Mercury is toxic to humans, and although the treatment harmed many people, it was commonly used for over three centuries. During the 1900s, non-mercury treatments for venereal diseases developed, and scientific studies on mercury poisoning, notably from the German chemist Alfred Stock, confirmed to other members of the scientific community of its toxicity to humans. Although its use for venereal diseases fell out of fashion, mercury-based dental amalgam fillings continue to the present day in the midst of much controversy. If you had or have mercury fillings, you will want to be careful as you begin to use the mucusless diet healing system. When the dormant poisons from heavy metals begin to re-enter your system in order to be eliminated, many unpleasant symptoms may arise. In general, be careful to not be too aggressive with strict fast or fruit-only periods while you are eliminating these poisons. For support and guidance in safely confronting mercury-related issues using the mucusless diet, it is advisable to seek assistance from an expert mucusless diet healing system practitioner. Number 9. In addition to congestion, eye strain can also cause eye issues. To learn about methods that have helped people remove eye strain, see William Horatio Bates, 1860-1931, through 1931, Perfect Sight Without Glasses, 1920. Support groups with modern practitioners of the Bates method are also accessible online.